<sighs> Alright, the pressure of having not uploaded anything in months is getting to me, and at the rate YouTube's going, by the time I actually finish my next excessively long video essay retrospective, they'll have officially outlawed videos longer than 3 minutes in their ongoing push to compete with TikTok and their audience's nat attention span. Anyway, since I stopped with the end of year roundups, I'll never get another chance to talk about the only other new release I played this year, and if you know me, I'll take any opportunity to talk about my favourite thing, Plesiosaurs. Jurassic World Evolution 2 dropped last week, the sequel to Frontier's 2018 Jurassic Park builder and spiritual successor to one of my favourite games ever, Operation Genesis. And at the time of writing, I've sunk about 42 hours into it, and I got some thoughts. Evolution 2018 was a very flawed game which I enjoyed quite a lot. As a park builder and business simulator it left a lot to be desired, with a litany of head scratching, logic defying game decisions which made challenging its main game modes more of a chore than anything, just needed to unlock all the things for the actually enjoyable sandbox experience. Dinosaurs who'll piss shit themselves and headbutt their way through four foot of solid concrete because a tree looked at them funny, visitors complaining because they might have to walk more than 40 feet to get to the nearest gift shop, and a head of security desperate to have you play out his dinosaur knife fighting fantasies. For science, probably. The American army can use this to their advantage. <laughs> Somehow, in spite of all of that, I tentatively liked the game, particularly with the return to Jurassic Park DLC bringing back that real nostalgic element from the original movie. Still, Evolution 2 comes along and promises to build upon the foundations of the first game and be an all around better experience. So is it? Well, yeah, sure. Okay, right off the bat, I like the game. I really like it. But I'm the guy with a Jurassic Park poster above his TV and a Dilophosaurus skull in his kitchen. I'm kinda biased. So while on one hand I do get a giddy joy out of seeing the Lost World Tiger Stripe skins on the Velociraptors, or when I release my first Tylosaurus into a lagoon, I do more than recognise the game's faults, and I'm going to be kinda harsh but know that I do so from a frustrated desire to see a game I love be less shit. This is definitely a two steps forward, one step back situation, so where to begin? First off, I have very little to say about the campaign mode, which I quit after one mission. Railroading the player is perhaps the greatest sin these games are guilty of, after the tadpole Deinonychus design, and I get very little out of being told what to build, exactly when and where, all while a Chris Pratt impersonator yammers on about how Mario's normal now. But thankfully there are three more game modes to choose from. If you're like me and you just want to build your park the way you want, Sandbox is the ultimate end goal, but you won't have access to any species, upgrades, attractions, nor all the maps until you've unlocked them in any of the other game modes, through research and genetic reconstruction. The challenge game mode makes a return, with different scenarios and difficulty settings to reach a 5 star rating park in a limited time, with cosmetic rewards locked behind these. I've done one or two of these and I've enjoyed them enough, but I think the last game just really put me off this particular mode, locking some of the most desirable dinosaur skins behind high difficulty runs. But they're ironically also the most liberating game mode outside a sandbox, letting you pursue whatever species and make whatever type of park you want. On my first successful run in the Canada park, I made a bum rush researching aquatics and dedicated half the site to a SeaWorld style marine exhibit getting my first look at Plesiosaurs, Tylosaurus and, one of my personal favourites, a suspiciously crocodilly looking Liflurodon. Hmm. Lastly, we have five miniature campaigns known as Chaos Theory Mode, basically a what if scenario for each of the five movies, with none other than Jeff Goldblum himself giving us a brief synopsis of each. Actually, the first thing I did when I got the game, you know, after quitting out the overly tutorialising campaign mode that is, was jump straight into the Lost World San Diego scenario, where I'd end up turning the abandoned Jurassic Park site, seen briefly in the, dare I say, criminally underrated second movie, fight me, into a fully functioning animal attraction a few miles outside the California city. Complete with the paired male and female Rexes from the film, you're simply given the objective of making this place operational, with the only limitations being set species for the scenario. No Indominus Rexes, no Aquatics, and no Pterosaurs sadly, but again, upon completion the map is available on sandbox mode along with everything else, so these options will be totally available there. I've so far finished the Lost World and Jurassic World scenarios and working on the original Jurassic Park, and I gotta say, while they can be a little railroady, especially that original park, which seems to concern itself more with being yet another tutorial, 
Chaos Theory might actually be my favourite of the game modes in terms of balancing gameplay with a narrative. You'll never know just how happy I was to see that the San Diego Amphitheatre was actually able to house dinosaurs, or the satisfaction of trying to make a movie-accurate Jurassic World Main Street with all the stores, with the lagoon out front, or the Jurassic Park tour ride, just like in the movie. Great fun! Minus the endless tornadoes. But anyway, having summarised the game modes, we need to talk about the actual gameplay, which... Oh. Might as well get this out of the way first, the game is pretty buggy. Like, pretty fucking horribly buggy. Particularly egregiously are legacy issues still in the game from the original, such as where dinosaurs will starve themselves to death because their AI doesn't know that there is water or food right fucking behind them, and this requires a trip to the main menu and back to fix. Aviaries in particular seem wonky for me, with pterosaurs often getting stuck on nothing or just generally being dumb fucks. And the dumb fuckery extends to the human AI as well, with ranger and medic teams somehow finding the worst possible routes to their destination while occasionally catapulting themselves into the stratosphere. I've permanently lost two ranger teams due to them getting stuck on rocks or inside an aviary somehow, and lacking an ability to fire and rehire a particular team, and with only two ranger teams to a station before upgrades, that's me just lost half of my park's welfare check capacity. Speaking of which, while we're thankfully no longer tasked with the endless busy work of setting rangers to refill feeders, we are now tasked with constantly reminding them to do their fucking job and check on the animals! That and top up their fuel every five minutes. Maybe it's me, maybe I'm bad at video games, because in theory the welfare check system works, and I, I kind of get it. It's the first in a few examples of Frontier trying to add another layer of complexity to the gameplay, but like all the other examples, it just boils down to adding more steps. The dinosaurs have stats, needs, terrain preferences, food requirements, health statuses, etc. But it's no longer a constant feed of up-to-date information. A ranger needs to go out into the park and check on them, with the easiest way to do this being to build a ranger post in the middle of their enclosure and assign the ranger team to that post and then reassign them, and then reassign them, and then eventually assign somebody else because this cunt's sitting having a coffee break while the Struthio Mind Maids are plotting a revolution. More extra steps in place of complex gameplay are the scientists. Now, instead of just selecting what you want to research and doing it, you have to assign a specific scientist to the job, each having their own strengths, weaknesses, and skill points and such. But since these parks still insist on employing the biggest bitch babies in their field, you'll need to periodically send the scientists on a break because three tasks a month is too much for them to handle, and any more than that they'll get pissy and poison the waterhole or some shit. Oh sure, you're on a 30,000 a minute salary, but yeah, take a break. Oh, taking a break costs $75,000? How about fuck off? Creating dinosaurs. On the bright side, dinosaurs now come in batches, which alleviates the painstaking issue of only being able to make two at a time, where by the time you've finally got a full herd of six, the firstborns are already trying to break through the concrete because they're lonely. You'll have an expected batch size, and various factors determine how many eggs are actually viable. But, again, extra steps. So now the process is split between synthesising the eggs and then incubating them. Two separate tasks, taking up two uses of your needy scientist fucks. More steps. Deeper, more complex park management was one of the features touted by Frontier, and again, yes, but actually no. Building customization is more than welcome, but building placement is still the worst thing since... Ah, fuck it, Deinonychus again. Seriously, why the head thingy? One of, if not my and many other people's biggest issue with Evolution 1 was map size, map shape, and building constraints. Three things inseparably linked to make you have a bad day. I was thankfully forward thinking enough to save before beginning construction of my first lagoon, which unlike fences, which have always been very freeform and customizable, are rigidly set snap together circles, which will absolutely refuse to place anywhere close to a hill, map boundary, building, path or water, ironically enough. Bars, restaurants, bathrooms and all the other amenities guests need are still as big a pain in the ass as their patrons. Oh, we've circled right back around to building customization again. Neat, I hadn't actually finished my point. Um, while the visual customization is good, the deeper park management aspect ultimately boils down to slapping on a few unseen modules, which will magically change some figures. That's all. 
And you'll need to painstakingly go through every one of your 37 cafes scattered around the park at 50 foot intervals for those lazy, unpleasable fucks to squeeze what numbers you can out of them, since this game, compared to its predecessor, is surprisingly difficult. Or, more specifically, uh, you actually need to think about your finances now? Evolution 1 did have times, especially during the earliest stages of a park's development, where you could go into the red, but beyond that, money would just snowball till thinking about the cost of anything became a joke. Not so here. My Jurassic World Chaos Theory run had me actually face the real risk of my entire dinosaur population dying from old age before I could acquire enough money to fill all the objectives for the Indominus Rex quest. And every time, just when things seemed to start to be turning around, a tornado. God, that campaign was a drag. Something Evolution desperately needed was environmental decorations. The green grass fields and bland Jurassic World infrastructure really got boring after a while. But with maps ranging from Canadian mountains to Isla Nublar to Isla... Britain, the settings in this game and overall environment are just so much more pleasing, and there's a great variety of foliage, ground textures, and rocks! Rocks! Honestly, it's actually kind of shocking when you think about how many features were missing in the last game. Now, while, as with all things, this does lead to some tedium, they've tied dinosaur preferences to actual environmental stuff, so it goes beyond just decoration into an actual game mechanic. Some species need sand, some need rocky outcrops, some like more water, some like less, some like the cover of trees, some more like open plains. Herbivores have had a surprisingly good overhaul, from previously needing one of two things, tall plant or small plant, to now different types of fibres, fruits, leaves, nuts, and all these different variety of foliage, species to species. You know, I've barely talked about the actual dinosaurs in this review so far. I guess I was trying to steer myself away from just rambling on about how dinosaurs are cool. Look at them go! But there is a lot of good stuff they've done here. First of all, the AI changes, while imperfect, are very, very welcome. Thanks to territorial behaviours, where members of a species will carve out an area which best suit them based on their needs and stick to that territory, you can now house different and even competing species in the same boundary. Some animals have friends, some have enemies. I particularly love how the Compsognathus is just the capybara of the prehistoric world. Like, they're just chill with everyone. All in all, this is a big area of improvement, capped off with a simple change to the comfort system which makes things infinitely more sensible. Evolution 1 had an all-or-nothing system. They're either 100% satisfied, or they will riot. If not now, then in 5 minutes time once the timer drops below 80. Minor inconveniences, be it a couple square foot less living space than they'd like, or not being literally drowned in trees, looking at you, Brachiosaurus, no longer causes the dinosaur comfort rating to bleed out completely, but instead will just give it a one-time hit depending on how big the infraction is. Last thing, which is both the most fun thing to discuss, and kind of the least important, are the dinosaurs themselves. Yeah, I, when I say least important, I mean, I could just be here all day gushing about how this dinosaur's cool, that dinosaur's cool, I like dinosaurs, but like, whatever, that doesn't tell you anything about the game. All I'll say is, variety, design, in general, are they fun to look at? Yeah, the game does a really good job. I'm Pretty happy. 84 species of dinosaur, pterosaur, and marine reptile in the deluxe edition. Uh, 79 normal. I might have miscounted. I, I, weirdly enough, I can't find a just straight up number online, and I'm lazy. There are some cut from the last game and its DLC, but as a starting roster, that's pretty great. And just subjectively, as a dinosaur nerd, I like a lot of the additions. The main concern I had when the game got announced, though, were the non-dinosaurs, the flying and marine reptiles. Like a lot of people, I was really excited for some sea life in this game. We got a bare bones, kinda lame honestly, Pteranodon in one of the DLC of the last game, but nothing in the water. This seemed like a weird omission, but personally, I'm happy with the numbers we ultimately got, with the assumption that we'll get, with a good, what, 20 plus new creatures through DLC eventually, with, what, two or three for both marine and flying? I don't know. As much as I really like the marine stuff, in terms of gameplay, it's a, it's probably the most, nah, bare bones of the three groups. There's very little you can do once you've built the actual lagoon itself, which, as I've mentioned, are very, very restrictive in the shapes and sizes you can make. There's no environmental editing, there's no... 
Well, that's it. That's that's <laughs> ultimately that's it. The shape and the environment. You have very little control over it. You just plonk down a big circle and then you put in some things which swim around and, and that and that's kind of it. I would really like to see environmental editing, creating reefs, uh, creating different depths and. Yeah, and I think certainly if you were to throw in some more creatures with different uh, depth requirements, that sort of thing, islands perhaps for them to rest on, I think it could be a lot more interesting. There's definitely more you could do with sea life. Maybe a dedicated DLC one of these days for a couple new species and some overhauls to the actual gameplay element. In terms of what new creatures, I don't know, I'm very much a proponent of body plan variety in this game. I mean, how many large theropods do you need? But we've already got Plesiosaur, Elasmosaur, Atomburosaurus, and they're all pretty similar, uh, so definitely no more of those. My suggestions, uh, Shoniosaurus, Shastasaurus, uh, you know, a bigger Ichthyosaur option, uh, Chronosaurus maybe? A larger Pliosaur to compete with the Mozo and Tylosaurus in a way like Plurodon can't. Then, maybe if they were to take up my suggestion for like uh, different lagoon depths and islands and customizable terrains, maybe a uh, Tanistrophius or even an extinct crocodilian, Dinosuchus or some of the weirder Triassic forms. I don't know, any more than that and I just think it would get a little bit too samey, but i definitely like to see a few more species. But as it is, the starting roster definitely covers their bases pretty well. Anyway, I think that's everything I really want to say at the moment. Evolution 2, overall, it's definitely one of those redo sequels whose first priority isn't to redefine the series from the ground up, but really just act as a replacement to overwrite the last game with an overall better package. Even if said package was dropped a few times during delivery, it's better than the first game. It does more and better with what fundamentally is still the same core game. If that isn't enough for you to really commit to the, the price, I totally understand. I have seen people reviewing and commenting on this game as nothing more than an expansion. And yeah, it is one of those types of games. If you want a deep and compelling theme park management simulator, this ain't it. If you want a Jurassic Park game with lots of pretty dinosaurs, it is. And you've probably already got it. I'm kind of interested now to see how the eventual release of Prehistoric Kingdom compares to this. I know there are people who have already said, or at least claimed in comments and reviews, that they've jumped ship over to what's seen as the better Jurassic Park game. Personally, I've room in my heart for both. The Jurassic franchise, after all, is more than just about a dinosaur zoo. There's aesthetic to it, there's a vibe, a feeling. So while Prehistoric Kingdom does have a bigger variety and more scientifically accurate attempt at making prehistoric creatures outside of just dinosaurs and, I don't know, maybe the actual park management system is going to be a bit better. Also it has Nigel Marvin in it, but that Jurassic Park feeling you can only get from a Jurassic Park game. Jurassic World, whatever, I hate that. What? Can we go back to calling it the Jurassic Park series? Sorry, just a minor point, fucking Chris Pratt. Anyway, thanks very much for watching. I hope this has been a little bit informative, if you're on the fence about buying it or whatever, and I also hope it won't be so long till my next upload. Reminder that we've got a second channel over at Red Scott Gaming Vault where we've mostly been focused on streaming, honestly, in the last few months, as well as other videos, uh, including our Fallout roleplay. That said, hope you enjoyed and speak to you again soon. Bloody hell, it's been so long since I made a video, I almost forgot to, you know, wrap it up with the whole Patreon thing. Thank you to my ongoing, continued support from my patrons. Bubbery314, Oda, That One Turian, Dahans, Bryn, Chea, uh, J Pastorelli, Stephen Parker, Army Ragnarok, Saiyan Warrior 7 Ariana, Big Noodle Dave, and Cory Montez. Thank you for still giving me money even though I haven't uploaded in months. I'm working on stuff, I, I swear to God. And I hope that you continue to enjoy the streams which we are consistently doing, at least, over on RSGV. Thank you again. Bye.